WAS. We've got our recording going. Welcome participants. This is our June mini conference. We've got uh, two presentations with then uh, following with a, a look, uh, further look at our, our conference that will be coming up at the end of September in Calgary. And we hope that you will be uh, available and be able to join with us. First up this evening, uh, coming from the East Coast is Ellen, Ellen Tapasheiver, Hoffer. Ellen uh, was an uh, uh, Oregon uh, graduate student here. Uh, that's when I first met her, uh, doing her master's here at the OSU. Um, she then went with the Be Informed Tech team, um, principally initially in, in uh, in California, where, of course, they did a, a, you know, beekeepers from a large part of the country, and then was the uh, uh, the one person in charge for the uh, uh, pollination tech team, the one that uh, concentrated here in the states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Um, getting tired of travel, she then took a, a more sedentary position at Oregon State University, um, doing all of the bee tech work and including some uh, uh, research and a lot of extension activities. But we lost her. She is now a, uh, let's see, I want to get this right, senior extension associate at Cornell University in, um, in Ithaca, New York. Ellen is going to talk about a project that she started here and I think largely is, uh, did most of the project here at Oregon State University and that is going on talk about overwintering queen banks. So Ellen, uh, uh, welcome. The floor is yours, all on queen banks. Thanks, Dewey. That was a great intro. And I do miss the West Coast quite a bit. Uh, I, this, this talk is going to be, um, I'm going to touch base on my project, uh, which had focused on overwintering queen banks in Oregon. It was a three-year study, but it's also uh, going to cover, let's see if I can advance my slides here. It's going to cover a lot of specifically the technique of queen banking. So, you know, introducing what queen banking actually is, what kind of equipment do you need, how do you build a bank, how do you manage a bank. I'm going to touch base a little bit on how to introduce banked queens when you're done banking them, a little bit on troubleshooting, and then the last section is my favorite section, which is the frequently asked questions, where I will go over some results from our study uh, that we did at OSU, as well as cover a lot of the research that's been done in other parts of North America, particularly in Canada, answers a lot of the commonly asked questions that I get on queen banking. And this is gonna be maybe about a 45 minute talk. Uh, there's a lot to cover when it comes to queen banking. And uh, I won't cover all of that in 45 minutes. So I want to draw attention to uh, a technical guide that we put out last year uh, through Project APSM. This is, a, I think the link is also in the kind of description of the webinar today as well. So if you don't end up being able to take a picture of this or reference this right now, you can certainly reference it in the description uh, in your email. But anyway, this is available online only and it's free. And I encourage everyone who's interested in banking and doesn't really know how to do it yet to read this guide. Okay, so let's just cover a brief intro. What is a queen bank? It is a living incubator. So it's a honeybee colony that can host multiple queens. And there are, of course, being beekeepers, there are different ways to do it. There are different types of equipment that we can use, but all in all, it is basically an incubator that hosts queens for a fair amount of time if you need it. So as a beekeeper, even if you only have just a handful of colonies, being able to build and maintain a bank colony can be a huge resource for you. The most common use of a bank colony is to host queens just before you ship them, if you're a queen producer, or to host queens just 
after they're shipped to you as a customer, right? But there are all sorts of other ways in which a queen bank can be useful. One of them, which I'll touch base on, is you can overwinter queens that this way. This is kind of the extreme case of queen banking, and we'll dive into that too. But a lot of queen banking is, is associated with shipping, right? And so kind of one of the, yeah, one of the, one of the real, I guess, I don't know, I was thinking about this the other day that shipping boxes when they're, when they're boxed with loose attendants, like this one, the picture on the left, it's almost in a way a little mini bank itself, right? You essentially have a group of worker bees that are effectively queenless. And so they're all taking care of all of the queens. They're keeping them warm, A, and B, they are feeding them. And so those are the two kind of main components, the main needs that queen, queens need if they're confined in a cage and they don't, you know, they don't have serve any kind of other function. A common statement that I hear from beekeepers is get your queens out of the bank as quickly as possible. This is kind of uh, alluding to this idea that a queen bank is harmful to the queen. And, you know, it, it kind of, I guess intuitively that makes sense in that you think that, you know, kind of confining the queen and keeping her kind of in this, um, just in an environment that isn't natural may be detrimental to the queen. That is the assumption. However, research has so shown, research from OSU and also research from other studies, from other institutions have found that banking colonies can be a reliable, uh, long-term queen storage system if the bank colony is not only prepared properly, but maintained properly. So let's cover equipment. So much like other queen production equipment needs, the equipment that you need specifically for a queen bank is has to be customized, has to be built yourself usually. Um, and you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but I don't think they have any bank frames uh, uh, available for queen suppliers or, or by, sorry, by bee suppliers. They do, however, have plenty of queen cages available, The numerous uh, suppliers do. And so we will cover both queen cages and bank frames that you need for the bank. All right, I'm gonna advance it. How do you use queen cages and bank colonies? So, here are just a couple of tips when thinking about combi uh, confining multiple queens. Each of those queens should be fixated on a bank frame. They should be inside cages individually. You should always have the mesh part of the cages exposed to workers. If the workers can't access the queen, they can't feed her, and that's a problem. You also want to seal the cages. So the picture on the left shows a California mini cage with a cork that's, um, that is easy to take out, right? The one on the left. And then the other one has the cork that's flush with the cage and it's more difficult to take out. So when it comes to banking, you wanna make sure those cages are sealed, but I want to caution you of using cork in the first place if you are banking your queens long-term because they can, if this cork is exposed to the workers over a long period of time, they can chew through that cork. So what I like to do, see the picture in the middle, is I like to put the California mini cages, well, I guess you can't see it from this angle, but the cork side is down where uh, it's not exposed to the workers at all. It's at the bottom of the wooden bar on the bank frame. Group the cages tightly. 
So you can see that in the, the picture in the middle, they are close together and they're also centered on the frame. This is so that the colony can most effectively keep the group of queens warm. And uh, the other thing to be aware of is that if you are banking uh, queens at any uh, for, for any duration, you should not have workers inside the cages. So you shouldn't have cage attendants inside because they will die in there. And that can pose problems when you're trying to introduce that queen leader. Okay, the other, the other equipment piece is the bank frame. This is what I was mentioning before where I don't think that you can purchase bank frames from a supplier currently. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so you have to build this yourself. And good news is that we do have at least one design available uh, in our technical guide. And so you can reference that if you are interested in making your own. Now you can have your frame just have, or you, can, you can build your frame so that it's what we call a single frame so that it only hosts one row of queens, or it could be a double. A double would then would host, you know, two rows of queens, they're back to back. So they're facing outward so that the mesh can be exposed to the workers still. And, you know, this is one of the great parts of beekeeping is that Every beekeeper has their own way of doing things sometimes, right? And so bank frames is definitely part of that concept. These are just four designs from beekeepers that I know just talking with them about banking. And they all have a slightly different design. The top left here, we have Michaela's bank frame. It has kind of a tapered closed gate. So you can access the cages from the right-hand side. Um, and you don't have to mess with opening or closing the gates. I like to have a gate that can open and close. So Harry Vanderpool, the one on the top right, has these um, welding rods that are gates that you can latch from the sides and you can open and close those gates so you can easily access um, a group of cages or just a singular cage and then uh, close the gate and secure the rest of the cages in the bank frame. Anyway, to, just to highlight a couple other designs, bottom left, we have Arthur Arthur's design, which is kind of a hybrid design of, of both of the other designs I just talked about. And then Steve Gomes has a really creative design specifically with JZBZ cages. So as long as you incorporate the orange JZBZ shipping bar, you can bank JZBZ cages pretty easily too in a bank frame. Here are some examples of designs of double bank frames. The real advantage to a double bank frame is that quite often when we receive shipments of queens, they come in a sleeve that already is uh, uh, the thickness of two rows of cages. Right, so this um, double bank frame on the left from Kona Queen, they, this is two sleeves of their queens that came in a, in a cardboard battery box. And all you have to do is just stack them on top of each other and drop them into your bank colony and you'll be set until you need to use them. Jumping right ahead to assembling your bank, your bank colony. I'm gonna cover two different seasonalities with bank, with bank colonies. Building a bank colony for the field season is, uh, is, is a more common approach to, um, to using a bank colony. And we can use but we can build a bank colony for the short term. And when I'm referring to a short-term bank colony, I just mean having a bank colony for two weeks or less. And then there's also a long-term bank colony. So at OSU, 
And actually I'll be building a bank just tomorrow here at Cornell. I'll be maintaining and have maintained bank colonies from, well, in Oregon, if we start in April and we would typically bank Queens all the way through to September and October. And the reason why we would do this is that we requeen all of our research colonies every year with sister queens. And we have a lot of old queens and sometimes they're great. And so we will bank them. And quite often we'll use most, if not all of them by the end of the season, but we maintain that bank colony throughout the season so that we can access those queens at any time. It's super useful. Six steps on how to build a bank, specifically a field season bank. So you go out there, you choose a healthy colony. What do I mean by a healthy colony? I mean, very low mites. And what we found with our OSU research is that what do low mites mean for a bank colony? Specifically, if you're overwintering it, it's very, very low. We're thinking one mite per 100 bees or less in your alcohol wash or powdered sugar shake. And you also want to make sure it's pretty big. Um, even if it's short, uh, a short-term bank colony, you want to make sure that you have enough workers, adult workers, that can keep the X amount of queens that you want to bank. So use your best judgment, of course, but also try to envision how big that cluster size is during those cold spring nights. Step number two is you find the uh, original queen, the queen that's in that colony, and you remove her. You then wait for the colony to be queenless or to, um, yeah, to be queenless. There are two different schools of thought for how long to wait. The first is that you only wait 15 to 30 minutes, and the other one is you wait a full 24 hours before you introduce, in this case, a bank frame full of foreign queens into your colony. I have, um, I have built banks under both of these circumstances. So I've waited 15 minutes. I've also waited a full 24 hours and uh, both work great. So I don't currently have a preference and I don't, I don't think you really need to. I think that you can pick either waiting 15 minutes or 24 hours, depending on your needs. The next step would be to place a banking frame of, of Queens in the center of your colony. So again, utilizing the, the bank frame as your, as your equipment, securing those cages firmly in that bank frame, according to the tips, making sure there's you know, no exposed cork, making sure that the mesh of the cages are exposed, et cetera. And then here's the key that I think a lot of beekeepers will forget when they're building a bank. Seven to nine days, so about a week later, after you've put those queens in there, you need to go back into your bank and you need to check all of the frames for queen cells. Even though there are plenty of queens that are in that bank colony, more often than not, the, the workers in that bank colony are somehow triggered into building emergency cells. And the problem with that, if we think about that, is that if you do not remove those emergency queen cells, they can raise a queen in there. And quite often, when there is a free roaming queen in a bank colony, there will be a high mortality rate of the confined queens in that bank frame. So you go through each of your frames, you lightly shake um, the workers off of that frame so you can best see like the full surface area of your, of your frames and you cut out any cells that you see, queen cells. And then the last step is that you add brood frames or young bulk bees to your bank colony about every two weeks. I've also had beekeepers say they do this once a week. So the key to that, this is if you are building a long-term bank. 
So every two weeks, you need to refresh that colony with young workers to best attend those queens because there is no free roaming queen. That bank colony has no ability to produce you know, young workers of, of their own. Okay, so I already skipped ahead to this. If you are interested in um, the kind of the, the, the logic behind these two schools of thought, whether you wait 15 to 30 minutes or whether you wait 24 hours before a colony is uh, uh, queenless, um, here are your reference points. A winter season bank colony. So if you are interested in overwintering banks, you build your bank in a, in a different way. So instead of having a either five frame nuke or a single that you're building your bank with, that would be for a field season bank colony, you are trying to make a very, very large colony unit. And I've outlined the different specifications of how different studies have built their banks. So it's gonna be different if you're in Canada, it's gonna be different if, if you're in you know, the more temperate environment of, of Oregon or California. I've outlined all of that in the technical guide in the frequently asked questions section. But in a nutshell, you want to make sure that the, your bank colony if you're overwintering it, has a lot of bees. So that's about 14 to 20 frames of bees and about eight frames of brood. And you also wanna make sure that it has a lot of food stores, specifically for Oregon at least, 50 to 60 pounds of stored honey. So five to six full frames of honey. And also another point is that you wanna make sure that you have some stored pollen in the bottom box. Why do we overwinter banks? Why would we wanna overwinter banks? Specifically for the US, it, it, there is a very, very high demand for queens and a very, very low supply of queens during the almond pollination. This is a critical time for beekeepers we wanna make sure that our colonies are queen rights so that we can satisfy our pollination contracts. And we want, and that, so that we can build colonies as well for you know, the, our other needs later in the season as well. We found that in Oregon, well, the Northwest in general, we did a needs assessment and found that 56% of our respondents, it was over 200 respondents, had difficulty purchasing enough queens to meet their needs for just general proper colony management throughout the whole season. So there is definitely a, a queen shortage in the Northwest. So the idea behind it is that there is a slight surplus of queens from California queen producers in the late season. So in you know August, September, October, we take those queens uh, or, you know, alternatively, you take Oregon grown queens that you produce in the summer. You overwinter them in queen banks. You transport them to California for the almond pollination and we'll have a, a surplus of queens available during January when you are um, inspecting your colonies for, you know, the first, second, third time and you need, you, you need queens. So the steps for how to build a winter, a winter season bank are very similar to a field season bank, except for the colony, as I kind of described earlier, is a much bigger colony. We have a double story, sometimes people will even do triple story colonies full of bees, full of honey. Again, you remove the queen, you wait either 15 minutes or 24 hours so that your colony is queenless. You place your bank frame full of queens in the center top box. And again, you wait about a week. You go through the bank colony, colony and you cut out any queen cells. 
The other thing I want to emphasize is that for a, a bank colony that you're overwintering, you don't add new bees every two weeks, but you can, because you don't do this, your bank colony is effectively queenless after 21 days uh, since it was established, since you built it. That would be an opportune time for you to apply a soft miticide that's very effective on sporadic mites. And so we did this at OSU where after 21 days after we established our bank colonies, we did an oxalic acid uh, dribble on the full colony and uh, it was incredibly effective. I will say though, that even though we did this, it is very important that you pre-screen your bank colonies, particularly for a winter season colony for Varroa mites before you select them and build them. So we recommend from our OSU study that you do not choose bank colonies that are or have more than one mite per 100 bees in your alcohol wash and your field test. And um, that's because we wanna make sure that we have healthy bees that live for a long time going into winter. And so even though we're applying an oxalic acid treatment 21 days after we build this bank, we wanna make sure that they have been relatively mite free or have, have at least low Varroa mite levels um, during their time in the fall so that we have healthy bees going into winter. Managing bank colonies. Okay, let's dive into the management part. As a rule of thumb, you should expect a couple queens to die in the first week that you bank them. But if you have an excessive amount of queens die, something went wrong. We'll cover that in our troubleshooting section. But here are a couple tips to minimize excessive queen death in your bank. It would be best if your queens that you bank are all roughly the same age and are the same reproductive status. So, for example, if you have a mix of queens that were just caught out of their mating nukes, um, you know, uh, two or three weeks ago, and you bank them in the same bank that uh, uh, queens that are a full year old, you would expect the younger queens to die, or at least be have a higher risk of dying. I was surprised by that when we found that. Um, I had thought it would have been the opposite, but the older queens are uh, preferred, that there is worker preference to older queens. Um, similarly, if you bank uh, queens with different reproductive status, so by this I mean if you bank virgins and mated queens in the same bank, Mated queens are going to be preferred by workers over virgin queens. So this uh, picture here on the right, actually, it's the, I think, the third um, cage in. That cage is a, a, a virgin queen, and the rest of the queens around her are mated queens. These workers are acting very aggressive towards the virgin queen. And I checked it back a day later and she died. Some other tips, um, make sure that again, you are placing your queen cages in the center part of the bank frame. If you uh, uh, only have kind of a, a partial, um, it, it, what do I mean by that? If you have a bank frame that can host 60 queens and you only have 20 of them, center them on the bank frame, put them in one of the upper rows of your bank frame instead of the lower ones. 
and always put it in the top box if you have your bank colony more than one story. So double or triple story, make sure that that bank frame's in the top box. And again, I emphasize, make sure you go back a week later to remove those queen cells from your brood frames. Another thing I wanna emphasize is that if you are maintaining a bank throughout the season, so if you're adding brood frames, every single time you add brood frames, you have to go back a week later and you have to look for cells. If you're building a bank to overwinter, so if you're building it in the fall and you live in a place where you have a pretty strong dearth in the fall, you're going to have robbing problems. Building banks takes time and those colonies are gonna be open for too long. Robbing pressure is high. And so there are ways that you can mitigate that, that robbing, but definitely be aware if you are planning to try this out, you need to be prepared to address the robbing uh, as you are building and maintaining your bank colonies. <clears throat> Again, I touched on this before, Varroa my management is huge when it comes to banks, particularly when you're overwintering them. So when you're selecting a colony to be a bank, make sure that you do an alcohol wash or powdered sugar shake and only select a colony if it has one mite per 100 bees or less. And then again, you can utilize the broodless period if it's a, a bank that will be overwintered by waiting 21 days and then doing a oxalic acid treatment, particularly the dribble treatment. I have not tried vaporizing a bank with queens in there. I do not know how they will do. Insulation. I like to put, if I have if I'm overwintering queens, I will overwinter either 30 queens or 60 queens. But, uh, but if it's 60 queens, I will do two bank frames of 30. So the picture on the right is one of our bank frames designed by Harry Vanderpool, uh, a beekeeper in Oregon. And, uh, we center those 30 queens in, uh, we, we center them on the bank frames. So on the outer edges, I put cut pieces of comb as a way to just trying to insulate the, the queens from the kind of outer cooler parts of, uh, of the, the colony um, cavity space. You can purchase styrofoam hive equipment from a number of the bee supply stores. We tried this a bit in Oregon and it works really well. Uh, you can also consider this if there, this is a big problem in California. If you are banking your queens in really, really high, hot summer temperatures, where it's particularly difficult to maintain banks in those hot temperatures, you can also try these styrofoam hive bodies and lids and bottom boards and to see if you can kind of mitigate that, uh, that temperature issue. Pest control wax moth. So if you use, uh, if you reuse your queen cages, you can get wax moth in there. And so I encourage you to freeze your cages because that wax moth can hatch out while your queen is in the cage and the queen can die from that. Small hive beetle, make sure you group your cages close, as closely as possible. Make sure you transfer queens to new cages when you're ready to ship. And install uh, in, if you are installing candy corks or any kind of queen candy for introduction, Make sure you do that after um, you're done banking them because the beetles will be attracted to that queen candy. <clears throat> okay, going over queen introduction a bit. 
So you wanna make sure that you factor in time to switch out those corks for whatever kind of introduction material you do. So in this case, uh, and most commonly it's queen candy. Another thing that we learned um, just throughout our, our kind of our, this process, this three-year study at OSU is that you can in a pinch introduce queens by just putting a piece of tape over them and popping two tiny little holes with your forceps um, into the tape so that they have something to chew on. That is uh, probably a more consistent um, mechanism for a slow release than that of a candy plug because we have all sorts of consistency issues with the perishable candy. Queen installation after banking, we touched base on this one. Building banks, you either wait 15 minutes or 24 hours from removing the original queen. You then push the queen cage into the comb of the bank or of, of the brood frame. Make sure the mesh is exposed to the workers. You place the queen cage near the upper edge of the cluster or the brood nest. And you don't revisit the colony for at least three days. There are a lot of opinions about that. Some people say you have to wait seven days. Some people say you have to wait a full 10 days. Point being is that you need to make sure that you, uh, that you don't cause a lot of disturbance during this process. It's just some pictures. Troubleshooting, let's touch base with that. Again, like I said, expect a few queens to die within the first week or so of establishing your bank. Our rule of thumb is that if you see at least 10% of the queens that you bank die within the first two to four weeks, or if you have a very distinct pattern, meaning all of your queens died on the top row, or all of your queens are dying on the sides. Um, that is a cause for concern. There might be something going on in your bank colony that you need to identify. Oh, <laughs> this is another plug for our guide. <laughs> so if you didn't catch it the first time, here it is again. Okay, now for my favorite section. We're nearing the end of, uh, the end of my talk, but this is, like I said, this is the most important section of my talk, frequently asked questions. Does long-term banking affect queen survival? Yes, it definitely does. Specifically, does overwintering banks affect queen survival? And it does. So here's a couple of studies that I'll be referencing a lot. Now, everyone has a slightly different way of doing it in that each of the studies has a different queen stocking rate per bank. And also they have different average queen survival rates. I think I include this in the next slide here. No, I don't. So I'll be going over this, but um, something to note is the location of each of these studies is pretty different. They have a pretty different winter. Marguerite Wyborn has uh, uh, definitely the most detailed uh, project regarding over overwintering queen banks. She did this in British Columbia in the 90s early, and late 80s. She banked 24 to 48 queens. She had an average of 60% queen survival. There is a research group in Quebec that have overwintered queen banks of 40 and 80, and they have various different um, average survival rates. And it's associated as well with exactly the temperature that they kept their indoor storage unit at, which was a constant either 60, 52, or 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Something to note about that study is that they had a significantly higher survival with their treatment group that was overwintered at a constant 60 degrees in indoor storage. That is a very warm temperature to keep your bees um, when you're overwintering them. 
So, and, and this is a bit outdated actually, the WSU study was published recently, earlier this year. So that's something where they, they had a unique study where they were looking at, um, they weren't overwintering banks. They were looking at putting queen banks in indoor storage unit, refrigerated unit um, during the summer. And they were comparing that to bank banks that were in the hot summer heat in California. That was their control group. And also they explored really high queen stocking rates, up to 200 queens per bank. And then there's our study. The first year we looked at just making 20 queens per bank, and then we stepped it up and looked at queen banks with both 30 and 60 queens per bank. All in all, each study has a different kind of range, different variants of, of queen survival rates. Um, so yes, when considering overwintering banks, both the, the temperature that they're overwintered at, the ambient temperatures, and the duration of the winter will affect your queen survival. So overwintering queen banks, you have a higher survival rate in the first three months of banking than the full seven month winter, right? Another finding is that, you know, like I had mentioned before, the research group out of Quebec had found that overwintering bank colonies at a pretty high temperature of 60 degrees constant had a higher chance of queen survival than their other both 42 and 51 degrees Fahrenheit treatment groups. Overwintering queen banks at a constant 59 degrees Fahrenheit had a higher queen survival compared to bank colonies held in the California heat. So California has, you know, approximately temperature highs of 95 degrees during the day. So that was another finding that was out of WSU. I kind of, I'm having a hard time. Here we go. Okay, I've minimized this toolbar here. Queen stocking rate may or may not impact the chances of survival. So what I mean by that is that some of the studies had found significant differences. So the research group in Quebec found a significantly higher survival rate when they overwintered 40 queens per bank versus 80 queens per bank. But besides that, you know, both the, the WSU and the OSU studies, we did not find um, differences in queen stocking rates. And so for WSU it was 50, 100, and 200 queens per bank. And for OSU it was only 30 and 60 queens per bank. Queen cage type and queen cage location on the bank frame also may affect queen cage survival. So queen cages held in queen excluder material had low, lower survival rates than queen cages that didn't allow workers to pass through the queen cage. Something that I'd like to just bring up to this group here is one of the kind of cool features of JZBZ cages is that they have what we call an access bar on the top part of the cage. You can pop that out with your hive tool and it's just it it keeps the queen in, but workers can go in and out of the cage at any time. I have not I have not experimented with banking colonies with the access bar removed. But what I'd like to bring up to this group is I am really interested in how queen banks, how queen survival would be affected if we were to bank queens and JZBZ cages with the access bar removed. If anyone has any um, experience doing that, I would love it if we could chat after this talk and, and I'd love to hear um, kind of whether it was successful or not. Overwintered queens are more likely to die in the outermost cage positions on a bank frame. So for 
you know, just this example, looking at this picture, if you were to place cages where the wax is on this bank frame, they are at higher risk of dying if you're overwintering them. Does long-term banking affect queen weight? Yes and no. Most of the studies weighed the queens immediately after they were removed from the bank. But one study, the research group out of Quebec, found that queens, they do lose weight when they're overwintered in bank colonies. But they found that the queens, the specific research group out of Quebec, found that the queens regained both their size and weight equivalent to queens that were just overwintered in five frame nukes only 12 days after they were introduced into colonies and they were free roaming, laying, laying eggs and kind of, you know, back to normal. So that's something to keep in mind when you're seeing results of queen loss, not queen loss, weight loss. Um, you know, it, it is really common to see, you know, queens lose weight. They're smaller if they've been uh, uh, banked for, a, for long periods of time, but we have a study that shows that they do regain that weight uh, pretty shortly after they're introduced into colonies. Does long-term banking affect queen reproductive quality? No, and by queen reproductive colony, or reproductive quality, it's getting late for me over here. I'm starting to... Um, we didn't find, and, and by we, a lot of studies, the majority of the, of the studies looked at sperm viability and none of them found differences in sperm viability. And this is between queens that are in banked colonies, bank colonies versus five frame nukes. We didn't see any differences in sperm viability of bank colonies of different stocking rates and also didn't see any differences of queens that were held at different winter temperatures. Does long-term banking affect the performance of colonies that have had banked queens introduced to them? No, this is specific to our OSU study, and this is preliminary data, just a disclaimer here, but we have, we have two years of data that look at banked Queens that have been banked over uh, over the winter, the Oregon winter, versus a, our control group is what's available, which is early season queens that are sourced from Hawaii. So early spring queens from Hawaii. We tracked them for a full year. So we introduced both sets of queens into splits that were made at the end of the almond pollination. We follow them all year round, and then we evaluated them the last time in the almond pollination the next year. We looked at things like queen retention, colony strength, so frames of bees, and brood pattern. We found that queen source is not associated with the odds of queen retention, meaning there, there's no significant differences between the different sources, whether they're banked queens or queens from Hawaii, with queen retention. Something that's interesting, and, and other studies have shown this too, is that generally speaking, all of the colonies in our study, uh, all of the groups, lost a fair amount of queens over the course of a year. So it's just an interesting observation. Looking at colony strength, colony strength is particularly important during the almond pollination because a lot of our pollination contracts require a minimum of four frames of bees and an average of eight frames of bees. That's a standard pollination contract, minimum four frames of bees. We found that um, we found kind of mixed results in that um, we found that one group of banked queens had a, a, a higher a, a chance of having at least eight frames of bees than the Hawaiian sourced queens, but not in the other source, banked source. So, and just to clarify with our OSU study, this particular set of data is 
uh, we have what we call banked one and banked two. That was, we had, we had bank colonies with two different beekeeping operations in Oregon. So they're just, they're just two different replicates really of overwintered banks. Evaluating queen performance, again, with brood pattern. So this is a picture of Carolyn Brees holding a nice frame of brood, a solid patch of capped brood. Um, this, and I, I'd like to have a little disclaimer that it is, it's questionable whether a capped brood pattern is a true indicator of queen quality, but we still measured it anyway. We, we measured it on a scale of one to five, one being absolutely terrible, five being amazing. And we didn't find any differences in brood pattern over any of the either uh, evaluation periods. We had four evaluation periods, June, August, October, and February, again, the next year. We didn't find any differences between our Hawaiian queens and our banked queens. I am just coming up to a full hour. I'm at 58 minutes and this is the end of my talk. I don't know if I have time to take questions or if that's the format of this conference. It is the um, format. Would you would you flip okay. back to your um, your uh, uh, summary slide there? You be, be, just before your acknowledgments there. Maybe did. that would be useful. I did. Yep. Just to recap, we didn't find any differences in um, acceptance rates when we introduced our queens uh, into colonies of both Hawaiian and banked queens. All of them were accepted. Um, and that was actually for two years in a row. Uh, no differences. We didn't find any differences in queen loss or queen retention uh, between banked queens and Hawaiian sourced queens during the 11 month evaluation period. We did, however, find a substantial amount of overall queen loss, an average of you know 43 to 56 per uh, on average per group size. Um, the biggest losses were recorded in August. And then colonies of all the queen sources were viable for almond pollination, meaning they had they all had at least four frames of bees when we evaluated them in at the first of February. But colonies with banked queens from what we call beekeeper one had more uh, had more colonies with at least eight frames of bees than Hawaiian queens, and so we had mixed results with with colony strength. And if I, I have time uh, to take questions, I'm gonna put this slide up. This is just a small survey that is useful for the grant that supported this project for Western SARE. So if you have the time, if you have a cell phone, center on that QR code, it's about, I don't know, it's about five questions. So uh, I'd appreciate any participation with that. Thank you, Alan. And I do hope uh, you can participate. Um, a number of the states with extension appointments really take that into consideration. So it would be uh, very useful. A couple of questions. You've answered um, the majority of them, but uh, uh, we just got one in from Medhab, a real good, interesting one. Alan, do you have some thoughts about queen loss of that 43, 56% range? during one year of the study and most losses in August? I think what makes the, what makes it, what makes it difficult is uh, we only, we only evaluated these colonies four times in an 11 month period. So it's, it's, really because of that setup, it's it's impossible for us to determine whether that queen was lost due to swarming or due to some other uh, some other factor. And so that that actually it poses kind of a big problem with this research question because if they're swarming, if the, the queens are being lost due to swarming, that's not really answering our question as to whether um, uh, uh, 
there's any kind of queen loss due to the queen quality, right? And so I'm not sure exactly how we will publish this, um, but it's, I guess, kind of, this is a kind of roundabout answer in that it's quite possible that high losses in August were, uh, it's, so, so it wouldn't be in August in particular, it would be between when we evaluated them in June and when we evaluated them in August, that was the highest amount of queen loss. That certainly could be because of swarming and we don't know, so. Yeah, interesting. Another yeah. interesting, Dwayne Combs asked, do the workers lose interest in the queens if you remove bank queens one at a time, such as like one a day? Not in my experience, no, they don't lose interest. Okay. Anne's question on fertility, I think we you've answered that in a number of different ways. Uh, and if you do have more, that you, Anne Atkinson, if you do have more, if you'd get in touch with Ellen on, on trying to answer that. Um, our next, our up, people up next, uh, Joy said that she thought that the uh, the uh, bank uh, uh, equipment might be sold by uh, the Hycombs in in Chico, California. The the uh, those clean Great. banking frames, yeah. Great. But they, but they also ask in, um, do you have any further information in terms of, of you mentioned mite levels, about how the mite levels um, negatively might affect queen banks? It really has to do with, and this is specifically with um, banks that you intend to overwinter. It has to do with the lifespan of the workers. So if you have colonies with high Varroa infestation, you do have a risk of your workers having a lower lifespan, having a virus cocktail kind of in the mix there, you know, at the end of fall isn't good for a, a colony in general. So even if you are going to clean up your mites pretty effectively with an oxalic acid dribble application, for example, 21 days after you build that colony, those workers are compromised because they've had a high level of varroa mites, you know, right around when you were building it. So in my case, I, I build banks that I intend to overwinter in um, October. So if I'm seeing more than one mite per 100 bees in October, that's an indicator for me that um, that you know the bank colonies are too high. We we have kind of anecdotal evidence that colonies with two or three mites per 100 bees uh, uh, don't fare as well. But again, it's anecdotal evidence. It's difficult to tease that apart when you know, we have a pretty small group size of bank colonies, you know, from year to year, 10 banks per, um, per season. Uh, and in our first year was five banks per beekeeping operation. So five banks among two beekeepers. So it's a pretty small group size to be able to tease apart varroa mite levels. And so at least from, you know, the perspective of the OSU study, we're pretty limited with, you know, our Kind of hard recommendations based on data, but you know we there we we've, we've had several cases of bank colonies that have really done poorly based on queen survival, that have also had um, two or three mites per one hundred bees when we look at them in October. So it it might it might be because the just not having bees live long enough is what it sounds like might in fact be the case that's what i think yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah uh finally we'll take a little short break uh this last one uh you just mentioned setting up october to over winter but uh but megan neal asked how soon before winter should a queen bank be set up that's a good question you you don't want to wait too long, right? You don't want to be building a bank when, you know, in the case of Oregon, it's it's cold and rainy. Um, but you also don't want to establish a bank 
that you're going to overwinter too early because you want to make sure that your bank colony has a lot of those winter bees. And we know from um, you know, research out of Ontario that they you, you start your colony starts to produce winter bees October and September, I believe. And so, you know, I I have established banks in September. Um, and they've they've done well, um, but I don't think that I would recommend starting them in August because I'd be concerned of just not having enough winter bees um, kind of set for the winter. I mean, I guess you could build them in August, but you would have to supplement, you know, the younger bees doing. You'd have to basically manage it like a field season colony, likely until you know, September, October, that would be my, my two cents. Yeah. Wouldn't you have to balance a little bit too when you're doing your mite control? If you're, if you're doing mite control in August, that mm -hmm. would be a, another whole factor. Yeah. That's a good point, Dewey. Yeah. Yep. You have to have, you have to give yourself enough time to prepare your colonies for winter, make sure they have enough food as well. So at least in Oregon, a lot of supplemental feeding happens in fall and also, um, yeah, Varroa mite management. That's huge. Yeah. Well, Alan, we thank you very much for um, your presentation. And uh, we can't overemphasize that um, the uh, font of all of this information is on the Project AFSM website. Um, all of that information is there with a publication yet to follow and um, the other references that uh, cited by Alan. Alan, thank you for staying up late with uh, for us uh, this evening. Oh, that's but it's not that late. And thanks so much for having me. I'm going to put my email in the chat in case anyone wants to reach out to me directly for uh, more questions and answers. Okay. There's one, uh, David Bond has one question in there that I, you partially answers, answered. So if you have a chance to take a look at that, maybe you can type an answer in. Okay. We'll take a short break, a couple of minutes, get up and stretch, get a snack, uh, another drink, whatever you might need. And we'll soon start with, uh, with Joy and Eric McEwen. Shorts we're going to work into this evening. Curtis started our recording again. Uh, we have a, a, a team to do our next one. Um, Eric McEwen heads the beekeeping operation at Digging Living Farm and their apiaries. And they're in a very rural area down um, in uh, what is southwestern Oregon, near very near the California border. Um, he has a BS uh, degrees in both botany and plant pathology from Oregon State University. And they've been on this farm and he's been experimenting with organic practices for about 20 years now. Uh, Joy uh, McEwen is, uh, manages the uh, farm and apiaries and the homestead. Uh, and also, of course, with the commercial beekeeping operations. She has two BS degrees in science, both environmental science um, and an MS also from Oregon State University. She also is a practicing apotherapist um, and uh, has a, a, a couple of unusual lines that include uh, some of the, the products uh, from honeybees as well. Uh, tonight, they're going to talk about uh, and share some insights from a new book that will be out very shortly, Raising Resilient Bees. It's about their journey and an organic beekeeping family operation, their unconventional means of developing an inbred line of honeybees with increased levels of resistance to varroa mite. I find it a fascinating star, uh, story, and I hope you will as well. So, um, Eric, Joy, I'm not sure who's going to start, but um, it's all yours. Take it away. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you, Melanie. We see you out there. Thank you so much for inviting us. We're really glad to be here. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, the, we're going <clears> to <throat> take you all on a little virtual tour of our operation and give um, uh, a, a history and uh, tell our story a little bit and in so doing, tell you a little bit more about the contents of our book and, mm -hmm. and why we wrote it. So uh, we uh, initially got introduced to beekeeping as, um, as uh, students of organic farming. And it was in our younger days in our 20s when we were getting extremely enthusiastic about uh, an agrarian rural lifestyle and looking forward to uh, living our passions and our values through farming. And we 
uh, experimented in several different avenues of agriculture, including market gardening and raising livestock and, um, and also uh, honeybees. And slowly but surely, our story is similar to so many's that the honeybees just uh, captured our hearts and minds and grew from a hobby into a sideline business and ultimately uh, to where we are today as commercial beekeepers. <clears throat> And then, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that uh, our background was really just in organic farming. And so once we decided to become beekeepers, we really just uh, had these deep values that we had learned from being organic farmers. And that really carried into our career as beekeepers and the kind of beekeepers we wanted to be. Yeah, and certainly our, our, our passions for how we wanted to keep bees shaped our business uh, model, and it also shaped our success rates. And many of the ways in which we chose to engage in beekeeping were certainly not the easy way and certainly uh, created big roadblocks for our success that we had to overcome slowly. And in so doing, uh, it became more and more clear that we wanted to write a book about it to share our, uh, share our mistakes, share our lessons, share our experience uh, with the beekeepers of the future. And for us, uh, maybe the most important beekeepers of the future are our daughters. And it became clear to us that we wanted to leave a written legacy for them because this, this 20 year journey encompasses their whole lives and they've had to, uh, they've had to live it and experience uh, their parents' woes as well as uh, our successes. So. Uh, yeah, so you see in the picture here, we have Fern, our oldest, she's 19. Clary Sage is our middle child right there in the middle, and she just turned 15. And then Tulsi is our youngest. She is 11. We are new to, to we're going to try to advance the slide. Here we go. Okay, this, this takes us way back here. So Fern is about two, so it's like 2006. We're at the Grants Pass Farmer's Market, and uh, this photo was actually even, uh, Kim Flottam took a, Kim Flottam took almost the same photo and 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 posted it in the uh, editorial comments at the beginning of the Bee Culture magazine many many years ago and used the photo as an opportunity to talk about the nuances of organic honey and whether as a product it actually exists. <laughs> and of course that was still Eric and um and Joy sorry this is Melanie Kirby. I don't think we can see your slides. I think oh, you no. need to click share screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. We did at one point, but let's go back and share again. Oh, can you come out? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And once you oh. click share screen, it might make you pick which screen you want to share. I mean, we see you and your lovely faces, which is awesome. Oh, ah! <laughs> no. We want to show you prettier pictures than us. Uh, <laughs> one second. We need to get out. Screen. No, no. Oh, oh that was sec. bad. That... I think we need to end show for a minute. Can you end show and then we can. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, yeah. maybe press escape or end show. There we go. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There and we then go. actually on your Zoom screen where it says share screen, share screen. click that. Yeah uh Ooh. okay um more share screen there oh. we go right i am um, yeah share okay yep yep here we go here we go and okay. now, now we see we, it now yeah. you got to play from start yes now play from start oh huh. yeah. okay. okay okay that's okay. it you are so there. there we are. So uh, here is our daughters again, Fern on the right, Sage in the middle, and Tulsi on the left. And okay. here is where we just left off, a photograph very similar to one that Kim Flottam took for bee culture about 17 years ago, 18 years ago. Uh, and so uh, this is just a, a picture to share with you our, our roots in organics and uh, definitely shaped our our business model and uh and and who we are so um here we go we're gonna go then. so um <clears throat> yeah this is a and this next picture is kind of along those lines this is the first generation 
of foundationless brood nest colonies that we ran. <clears throat> we ran a couple hundred hives like this. This was our first attempt at, at growing colonies that were consistent with biodynamic uh, management practices. So uh, specifically biodynamics asks that you have a brood nest that is comprised of foundationless comb that <clears throat> encompasses the entire brood nest in an uninterrupted fashion. And so this picture uh, is obviously a frame from outside the uh, brood nest, but essentially uh, you can see there's a little tiny bit of brood there in the center. And that, that brood nest when uh, in the center, of course, would be one full frame of brood and it's not interrupted by top bars or bottom bars or what have you. And so uh, that was a, kind of our first introduction into uh, our attempts at biodynamic beekeeping. And uh, we learned a lot from that lesson and we ran those colonies for about seven or eight years before retiring them. Um, so <clears throat> we, uh, we've been out in the Illinois River Valley of Southern Oregon. We moved to Southern Oregon in 2003. Here's Clary Sage with a nice natural brood nest frame out of one of those colonies. Um, yeah, and so we moved to Southern Oregon in 2003 and uh, shortly thereafter made friends with uh, the Jacobs from Old Soul Apiaries. And that was our introduction into queen rearing, uh, starting maybe back in about 2007. Mm -hmm. We started getting uh, queen cells from Old Soul and introducing those to mating nucleus colonies that we prepared out in the Illinois River Valley. And that was kind of the start to our our breeding of, of bees out in the Illinois River Valley. The reason we like being out in the Illinois River Valley it is it's about 30 miles west of the I-5 corridor. And because of that, it puts us a little off the beaten path. And so we actually are uh, the only commercial beekeepers in the valley and the only one engaging in queen rearing in the Illinois River Valley that we, that we know of. So we have had a lot of space and isolation and opportunities to pursue our projects out here um, unhampered by the in influence of other, other commercial beekeepers. So that's exciting. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Um, we just so, have a bit of an introduction here. This is yeah, a here, wood shop. <clears throat> this is a nice photo of our daughters, Fern and Sage. And this picture is here to, to mm -hmm. talk about our values that not only were we interested in organics, but we were interested in family-based agrarian beekeeping. So we wanted our beekeeping operation to be something that we would pass on to the future and, and something that would be about um, rooting our culture in agriculture, rooting our people in, in rural uh, agrarian lifestyle. So for us, it was about earning a living and, um, and being profitable. Uh, go ahead. <clears throat> well, and also in that is like a in permaculture, one of the values is like the value of succession. You know, how do we have the little plant being protected and nurtured by the big plants, right? So also in that same, like what is our, our values coming from organic farming? It is part of this permaculture um, philosophy of succession. So getting to have our young sprouts um, be part of the journey is really kind of our, our hope that they will want to take it, want to want to be part of it in the future. Mm -hmm. Well said. Oh yeah, here they are. Yeah, enjoying. Farm. Yeah, enjoying the farm. Our 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 ducks and chickens are practically part of the family. Well, I think that is part of it too. Is that we're not just an apiary. We are also a farm. We uh, uh, we we really enjoy just getting to. Uh, for the whole farm to be a system, right? So to be able to, to incorporate regenerative agriculture, even by using like our bee poop, all the bee poop on the farm to help build the soil, to grow better vegetables. It's part of our, what we like to talk about um, in our whole system approach. And so that leads us to a little bit of, this is a picture from relatively recently. This is where we have arrived to today. where. Uh, a still a relatively small commercial operation. We manage about about 600 colonies, uh, and this is uh, this is how we move them around. We're all just uh, one-ton trucks, and uh, we rent a semi to go to California in the spring. But this is this is how we move our bees around, mm -hmm. and uh, and where we've come to. And this is a 
good photograph of the kinds of places we like to keep bees. This is an organic commercial herb farm that uh, grows uh, about 80 different medicinal herb crops, most of which are tended by honeybees. And so we get the opportunity to make some really uh, wonderful varietal honeys and be part of a agricultural fabric of the landscape that, uh, that we're really proud to participate in. We, we work with some excellent farm partners and uh, all the farmers we work with take, take their jobs really seriously are excellent exemplary uh, examples in their field and uh, professionals and, and, and a joy to work with. And uh, we feel really privileged. We do. It's a big part of our success. We call ourselves their proud pollinators, but we're the proud pollinators of Herb Farm, Pacific Botanicals, Oshala Farm, these incredible certified organic medicinal herb farmers here in Southern Oregon and um, getting to work with them side by side and being, I mean, that is agriculture. It's the culture, like really involving people. How do we involve each other and making good decisions for the land? Here is uh, a round of young colonies out on the coast. We go, we, uh, aside from almond pollination, our operation pretty much spreads from the Oregon coast out near Crescent City uh, inland to the, the lower Applegate Valley and then and with the Illinois River Valley kind of right smack dab in the middle. Yeah, Alexander Family Farm, amazing organic. Uh... Yeah, 2,400 acre organic dairy in constant. Uh, that is like, now certified regenerative as well. Yeah, they do all rotational Farmer grazing. of the year, organic yeah. farmer of the year, these folks. Gorgeous farm. Yeah. And this is us. This is our home farm. This is us in Tequilma, Oregon. We're at about 1,500 feet elevation and uh, lots of access to wild forage. Fairly no commercial agriculture out in this valley. So we, well, we love the pristine nature of it, and it's a really uh, wonderful backdrop to keeping bees. We get a lot of rainfall, and it's a little bit cold at times, but it uh, pans out into a decent season that runs a little later than the Rogue Valley. I just want to say, and this right here, right there in the background, or that's Hope Mountain that you're looking at right there, which is was the home to the Tequilma, the Tequilma tribe. And so uh, that brings Here's us to the book project. Uh, we, we wrote the book, Raising Resilient Bees, Heritage Techniques to Mitigate Mites, Preserve Locally Adapted Genetics, and Grow Your Apiary. And uh, so we wrote the initial manuscript in January of 2020, and we submitted a proposal in December 21, 2021 to Chelsea Green, and we were contacted in April of 2022. Uh, and uh, asked to do the project. And so it, it took uh, about five months of editorial work with Chelsea Green through to February, 2023. And the last copy edit finalized on May of 2023. And the book is uh, on sale now for pre-order with uh, uh, bookbin.com and Amazon. Chelsea Green. And on Chelsea Green's website. And it will be available July 20th in bookstores it, it's at the printer right now and really the main thing i want to just say if any of those folks are watching a, just an amazing experience getting to work with chelsea green and their team just the level of professionalism and editorial review was was um just such a wonderful folks to work with yeah, just really, really helped, beautiful help take the project to where to where it is for sure yeah. so um so in preparation for this presentation, Dewey uh, suggested that we uh, ask ourselves to define what does raising a resilient queen look like for us? And, and so I, I wanted to step back and just say that, you know, in bio, biodiversity has a value uh, in the higher the biodiversity there is on the natural landscape, uh, the more players there are involved in the more complicated the natural system is the more capable that system is to withstand or endure changing environments without catastrophic loss of life, right? And so, uh, or, or a reduction in carrying capacity. So likewise, we think that this is not only true on a species level, but this is true on, on a population level within a, any given species. So like the more variation there is in particular traits that a honeybee population has, 
then the more stable that population is in the face of dynamic changes. So for us, raising resilient bees is about engaging in trying to be a force, uh, a positive force for selection of superior traits while also making sure that we attend to the maintenance of as much genetic diversity within the population that we're managing as possible. So for us, that, that became a goal. And so that goal took the form of, of our interest in developing a long-term uh, project to, to develop an inbred line of bees. And what we wanted out of our inbred line of bees is involvement and interplay between us and the feral population. So we do all open mated uh, mating and we do it in isolated locations where we can have strong influence from our background feral environment. So we, uh, so uh, yes, that, uh, sorry, I lost myself. Uh, here we go. So. Uh, that that goal of developing an inbred line is something that we kind of dove off at, and right now we are at our 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 eighth season, or seventh seven years and some of of not accepting any new matrilineal DNA into our operation, mm -hmm. for starters. So we closed off our breeding project to only the genetics that are contributed through open mating and uh, the existing lines of queens that we have in our operation. And uh, for seven years now, what we've been doing is raising colonies from every extant colony in our operation that can have divides made from it. So essentially, uh, depending on the different, the fitness of any individual colony, we will raise more or less new colonies from each colony every year. And so you can see that there's this opportunity for a gentle selection force and a convergence of the genetics to where we're starting to see an indication that most of our bees are probably pretty related to each other as of now. So we wanted to do all this while avoiding any kind of genetic bottleneck events. And so, you know, uh, by raising queens from as many different matrilineal lines in our operation as possible, we hope to capture and retain rare characteristics, rare alleles inside the population, while also kind of moving us towards gentle selection for resistance traits. So uh, we have, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, there we go. We have for uh, about eight years now, maintained a minimum winter population of 250 colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, these colonies are exposed to different selection forces. And some of those selection forces are selection forces that we have control over, and some of them are just uh, part of the environment that the bees live in. For instance, like the weather when divides are being prepared uh, is certainly going to influence their success rate. The weather in the season preceding splitting colonies is going to affect how robust individual colonies are and whether or not divides get made from them. Uh, the health and condition and the age of queens is variable within the operation. So you know, uh, one might say we're selecting towards younger queens that are more uh, productive, but we also might be selecting towards older queens that just continue to persist inside the operation. Those, the, the kind of stuff's hard to tease out. Of course, uh, the lack of brood disease. That's one thing that, uh, uh, you know, has to be uh, a condition that uh, it, we insist on for, for reproduction. So, um, and then of course, the quality of the forage in different locations and how it affects the resources in hive and how robust a colony comes out of spring. These are all the kinds of things that are variables, selection forces that are a little outside of our control, but then there are selective forces that are inside of our control. For instance, we're, we, our operation has never used antibiotics. Yeah. So we would like to hope that that action is selecting for antibiotic resistance in our operation uh, in that uh, that combined with excluding colonies expressing a brood disease would hopefully mean that we are uh, selecting gently for uh, disease resistance. Uh, we also use minimal mite treatments. So I think we're about five or six years now of only oxalic acid and, uh, and only a couple of treatments a year. Basically, we're trying to maintain selection pressure, kind of the soft bond effect, if you will, 
uh, we're training maintain selection pressure on our bees uh, and maintain a, a relatively high level of mites in our operation, but try to avoid bringing the roof down and losing potentially good genetics. Yeah. So we use mite treatments at, at a minimum, and we hope that minimal use of mite treatments is allowing us to select for varroa tolerance. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, here we so go. yeah, so okay. we do two rounds or so, or even up to three here. rounds uh, that I'll yeah. explain that uh, of, of colony divides each spring and how we make divides is our whole operation is kind of geared around the walkaway split. So we raise, we don't do any grafting and we raise all of our queens in hive from eggs. And that's something we've been experimenting with for about 20 years and, um, and are pretty satisfied with our success rates. This picture here shows a queen excluder sticking out of the side of the box. We used to be 10 frame and we have a big collection of queen excluders, but we don't use queen excluders in our management of our bees, except for one thing, yeah. preparation of walkaway splits. Yeah. And what we like about our 10 frame excluders is that when we use them to prepare walkaway splits, they it's stick the out the side and when you come back into the yard to remove your walkaways, you can easily spot them by the excluder sticking out. So that's why we stuck that picture in there. But this is a picture of an isolated yard in the Sierra foothills where mm -hmm. we start our season every year. And uh, those are all walkaway splits in the background with drone source colonies in the foreground. Um, and so, um, mm -hmm. Uh, our, our, call, our, our walkaways are comprised of, of uh, four frame um, mating nuclei made up as strong as we can uh, and uh, made up in two-way boxes. All of our equipment is standard two-way potential. That, those are division boards on the lids there that are just being used to mark uh, these hives. So the two two things we're encountering most often is either one queen successfully reared or two queens successfully reared. And then those colonies are segregated and some of them were, were uh, supered and some of them were loaded on a truck and taken back to Oregon. So that's just keeping track of which is which there in the foreground. Yeah, actually, and those division boards sitting on the lid were actually just used for markers, but those colonies in the foreground actually still have their division boards in them because those are actually colonies that succeeded in rearing two queens. They uh, also, that's a, those fields can turn a little bit purple in the spring. We, they have a really nice uh, wildflower bloom up there and it is definitely dominated by vetch. It had a wonderful season. We'll show some pictures a little bit later in our talk of that, but here you can see after, uh, after confirming only a single queen in these hives, then they were supered up and left in California for another few weeks to grow up. This is a picture of our mating yard in the center of the Illinois River Valley uh, in Oregon. And uh, we, have, we have out yards in all four directions from here within a mile or so, and we stock them heavily to make sure we influence drone source. Um, but we also have a mating yard upriver where we do a little bit less drone source stocking to try and ensure that we're getting a good involvement of feral drones. We live in a pretty small town and that is a busy road. We get a lot of hoot and hollers there yeah. from passerbys and they see us rooting us on. A lot of honking and waving. <laughs> so here, uh, if you look closely, the center of this frame near the bottom bar is three queen cells being reared. Those are what some people would refer to as emergency cells. We think the term emergency cell is a little bit derogatory. And while there is some truth to the fact that you can raise a crummy queen from an emergency cell, we feel that the opposite is also true, that if you attend to the details, that you can get very good queens from emergency cells. That is a queen uh, reared from an emergency cell. You can see the cell is very well, well worked. It's definitely adequate in size. And we see things like this a lot. And uh, the key to getting good quality queens from uh, a walkaway split has a lot of similarity to how you get a quality queen with a uh, queen uh, cell builder. And uh, that you attend to some of the same things, which is food, brood, 
the presence of lots of young bees and in general, the presence of a lot of bees total. So when we make up our, our walk away splits, we make them really fat. We make sure that they are bustling with bees and, mm -hmm. um, and then you get cells like this. Gorgeous. And then oh, uh, a month gorgeous. later, we, we get, we have to wait a full month because we're raising queens from eggs. And so uh, it's about a 30 day process before you're going to find a uh, capped brood to, in, to evaluate a queen. And when we come back and evaluate this queen, we're very happy. And I will say this is uh, a picture from this spring and typical of our experience this year. We had great mating weather. It was pushed off mm -hmm. almost a month, but the upside was excellent mating and some really great looking queens. Um, okay, and then this is a picture uh, that's kind of saying, well, where are we heading? What, what are we seeing out of this? And uh, I put this picture up because we, we thought it was kind of telling. When we got our operation started for many years, maybe seven years or so, we got almost all of our queens from Hycom honeybees in, in Chico. Mm -hmm. And we got exclusively NWC, uh, New World Carniolan Queens. And so our operation was very uh, dark in coloration. Most all of our queens were black when we, when we got started. And then we met uh, the Jacobs at Old Soul and we started purchasing queens from, uh, from Old Soul. And a lot of the queens looked like this queen here. Tiger tiger striped but what's interesting now is that this coloration here this coloration and this coloration here kind of the wild type italian coloration is what is dominant in our in our operation and we find that interesting and some uh anecdotal evidence of some genetic uh convergence and genetic drift or you know transformation of our operation away from uh its grafted origins and more into um its own, uh, maybe the first indications of being an inbred line. Um, one interesting side note is that this queen pictured here and this queen pictured here are at least half sisters. They, they had the same mother. And so just an example of the variability of, of genetic, uh, the genetic variability, if you will, within the operation that, um, a queen can still contribute many different color patterns to her daughters. Um, but in general, we are seeing the, uh, our, our queens uh, looking more and more, more, I would say about 60, 70% of our queens look like this or this, which we're, we're finding interesting. And uh, so uh, that's sort of a, in, a kind of a segue into some of the things that we're working on for the future, which are um, some genetic testing to kind of get a handle on what these bees are where their, uh, where their genetics come from, and ultimately to start looking at doing some lineage tracking. We've been working with a, a tech savvy individual to develop a uh, spreadsheet, a database that's gonna allow us to lineage track all of the queens and actually ultimately document the, the level of genetic variability and the level of genetic relatedness inside the operation. And ultimately we hope to then sample the feral population and compare. Um, so we tried doing this a, yeah. like 10 years ago and we would name all of them like Rose and they would be like Rose Delia and then Rose Delia Zinnia and then Rose Delia Zinnia Buttercup. And it just got so chaotic and that it will be really nice to have somebody that will actually just like number them properly and help us organize all the data <laughs> without us trying to name them fluffy names on their lids. <laughs> yeah, some QR codes, I think, are going to help <laughs> yeah. in this a yeah. lot. Um, so then a segue back to uh, the agrarian nature of things. Um, like I like <laughs> we said in the beginning of our talk, we like to participate in agriculture. And one of the things that we feel really strongly about a value that's really strong for us is, is producing food, a surplus food to, to feed people. And we really believe in the yes. quality of honey as a food for people. Well, yes, definitely. Well, we can show you all sorts of different photos of us enjoying honey, but our family, our family of five eats like about a pound a day. We decided. Yeah, we're probably about yeah, a pound we a day. <laughs> 
<laughs> we eat a lot of honey. And I mean, we just really feel like it's the, it's the, you know, the mana of the earth. It's the best food possible and the bees make it with them. And it's, yeah. So, so we're just try to encourage more and more people to eat more honey. This is our first honey crop of the year yeah. uh, made in California. As you can see, it's time to leave, but those bees succeeded in producing about 2000 pounds of wildflower honey. And, uh, and some colonies gave a surplus of about 80 pounds or so right before coming back to a big main flow in Oregon. So uh, we will be starting to extract in a few days. Uh, but this mm -hmm. is our first honey flow of the year. And that is it right there. Vetch dominated, beautiful wildflower honey and uh, box after box with just completely capped out. Pretty exciting. And this is a, a honey making yard of ours from the Applegate. This is kind of a typical configuration for us in making honey. We stock 24 to 32 colonies in most of our summering yards. And um, this is typical. This is from Pacific Botanicals actually, like a 240 acre organic herb farm. So uh, another practice that we alluded to earlier in the talk is uh, attempting to keep bees in organic and biodynamic fashion. And mm -hmm. this has been a, a passion for us from the start. And so we are always conducting experiments and growing colonies out in unconventional ways. And this is the way that we are moving in our, uh, in our operation and the way we, we outline in great detail in our books, which is growing out foundationless brood nests on these three-sided frames that allows us to nadir the colony and uh, and grow out large uninterrupted brood frames that are 13 inches deep. And Some, it includes an end bar. Right. For just the stability of trying to say one of the things that we have to try to do is figure out, you know, the best way to have stability as the bees are drying out the comb so that there is so that it is still a movable frame and that we can be moving it back and forth and the end bar really helps us and the bees be able to draw out nice straight combs and yeah and have these colonies transportable and handleable during the heat of the day we uh we love the three-sided frame we've experimented with keeping bees in worry hives and they just don't um don't perform in the way that we would hope them to for, for the kind of beekeeping that we do. And one of the main things is that we like to produce honey. So. Yeah. Uh, and so these are a couple of newly established, as we call them, natural nest colonies with uh, foundationless brood nests that were, you can see they were just recently nadired with another box and now they started growing out their comb on the bottom. You can see all that bottom comb is been made in the last couple of weeks. So nadirian is just putting an empty box underneath it so that the comb can go ahead and draw all the way out uninterrupted. In those first um, slides we showed you where there actually, it was a really long frame, but there was a bottom bar. This is a way that the bees can just continue to draw down the comb and nadirian with that empty box enables them to just keep going to their leisure or to their hard work, not really leisure. <laughs> Um, this is a, a picture kind of denoting that we also run four-sided frames foundationless a lot as well. This is a foundationless frame that the bees drew out almost exclusively in drone comb, and we get that pretty frequently. We work, we manage our, <coughs> our frames to minimize the amount of drone comb, but we still have significantly more drone comb produced in our colonies than a colony with just worker foundation. However, we use this to our advantage. We use these frames uh, to pull drone brood uh, to minimize mite populations, but we also send these along in all of our walkaway splits to bolster drone populations in our mating yards. And it uh, turns into a real nice win-win because the mites that are present in the drone brood are essentially flushed by the one month broodless period in the walkaway. So and we think of it as uh, a, a double whammy. Here's a great photo. This is just kind of explaining that uh, what we do is definitely advanced beekeeping. The bees don't always cooperate. You can see in this photo, the frame on the far left is a four-sided frame that had foundation in it and was used as a guide frame to encourage 
these bees to draw out their foundationless combs in a straight line. And as you can see, as they get further and further away from that guide comb, their combs are getting less and less straight. So to minimize that kind of problem, we actively manage our, our brood nests and, uh, and straighten or cull crooked combs in order to keep the colony inspectable and the frames movable. Or add another guide comb. Right. So um, there is a piece of foundationless cut comb honey, a honey frame that we would harvest for comb honey. And uh, we do harvest a fair amount of comb honey since we got involved in this project and consider that a perk. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a nice close up of a uh, of growing out a foundationless brood nest. You can see the guide. Now, actually, on the far left, that is actually a division board, not a frame. And, and that we our boxes have dado cuts so that we can store our division boards in, in the hive. Um, and, uh, which we occasionally do. But then to the, to the right of that is actually a guide comb that we uh, introduced into the box with seven foundationless frames to encourage the bees to draw out straight comb. And you can see in this instance, they did a really nice job. So, and this hive is ready for nadiring. Yeah. Uh, here's just a photo of our, our woodenware that we make ourselves. This is outside of our wood shop. Uh, you can see that there's a finished and unfinished uh, palette here. Uh, and uh, also right here in the foreground is our, um, our dipping vat where we're using um, a linseed oil finish with the beeswax to coat the hives. This is also another part of biodynamic and organic standards is to not be using any like plastics or latex. And so just to have our natural finish has, um, and just the, the, our philosophy that we're also using cedar and wood, redwood um, that is sustainably locally harvested here in Southern Oregon uh, as, as the home for, for our bees. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, some more shots, shots from the wood shop. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Um, we can see we do a whole slew of different work in here. But I think, something? well, I just think it's one thing just to be noted that it's, this is family sized. Like when you first get started beekeeping and you need to get the extra frame and you want to go <clears> buy it from someplace else. It's also just one of these values in organic and biodynamic farming is to really try to decrease the amounts of like imports inputs into your farm system. So instead just being able to make this right here at home, we just didn't know that we would be able to do this, you know, like being able to start and have a, a home wood shop to be able to make our own equipment. But actually, even you can see in this photo, this is just a family scale. This is something that a family farm can participate in. And I mean, most be beekeepers to have a wood shop on site, but even something, you know, our wood shop is small, but it does make a lot of equipment. Well, and, and a lot relative to the scale that we're operating at. Yeah. And Joy was just commenting the other day that she met someone who said, they had some family up in Washington that just got into bees and uh, are having a great time at it. They just grew their operation up to 10,000 hives. And right. you're just like, what? You know, this, there is no way that we could ever grow in an unsustainable fashion like that if we stick to our principles. For us to add a few hundred supers uh, in a season to our operation is about all we can do. Yeah, so, so we grow is, slow. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. And here's a shot of our migratory lids that we produce. You can see on top of our migratory lids is that extra pair of cleats. And I will just back up and say that extra pair of cleats is um, allows us to stack our equipment. Our bottom boards fit perfectly onto those. And so this kind of brings us back full circle to uh, queen banking. As, as beekeepers who don't graft and as beekeepers who don't put queens in cages, mm -hmm. we have to accomplish our goals of having queens available for us early in the year in a different way. And so how we accomplish that goal of having queens available for, uh, for fixing up queenless units 
uh, before almond pollination is we we overwinter nukes. Exactly. Yep. And so our equipment, uh, uh, thinking back to that picture Ellen showed of the styrofoam uh, queen bank, our our equipment is kind of the natural equivalent of that. Uh, the Cypress family woods are closed cell and actually highly insulated. They actually have good R value. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of our natural hives with good R value that stay dry, don't absorb the respiratory gases of the bees, combined with this stackable wintering feature allows us to reliably winter nukes. And so uh, by making splits in our operation, walk away splits as a mechanical tool for mitigating mites, the byproduct is that we also produce a large number of winter, or uh, sorry, of summer nukes that we winter uh, on top of other colonies, either in stacks or by wintering nukes on top of a larger overwinter colony. And that combined with the highly insulative hive bodies uh, gives us pretty good wintering success and allows us to bring hundreds of small colonies to California. Ready to go. And uh, value added products have always been a big part of, of how we be keep and how we make a living at the scale that we operate at. We seek to get a maximum return on all of our products. And we have direct marketed almost all of our products for the last 20 years. We are just now starting to do some wholesale. Here is uh, us preparing chunk comb honey that will be uh, topped off with extracted honey in our commercial kitchen. You want to talk about this one? Oh, well, <laughs> here we go. It's, we got a, a picture of, um, of our, um, of our John. So John is like kombucha, but it's made with um, honey instead of sugar and green tea instead of black tea. And um, it's a, a, a ferment a, a, that still has a, a SCOBY, a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And it's good for, good for the gut, which is good for the brain. Lots of probiotics and prebiotics. And we make a whole line of them. Um, mm -hmm. And Joy is the master brewer. And uh, we market them to restaurants. I think part of it too, it's, it is trying to like, how do you make a living at being a family beekeeper? And it really does help at the farmer's market booth to not just have honey. When we have John and energy balls and propolis and oxymels, and we're giving out samples of all this, it does make us um, just get noticed a little bit more. And the John in particular is kind of considered the champagne of kombuchas and it's a hot day and it's nice and refreshing. And we really do. And um, we, we get a lot of takers uh, definitely on our samples. This is our daughter, Sage, helping cut, cut comb. You, you saw some pictures earlier of our chunk but preparation. again yep it's just like yep, trying to have a diversity so then at market we have not just honey but that day we have chunk honey or comb honey here is our oxymel uh production we make up the solvent mixtures of vinegar and honey and then we tincture different herbs in them and then combine those tinctures into different formulas this is an old type of medicine. Sometimes when you see tinctures, like herbal extractions, they're all in alcohol. And yet honey and apple cider vinegar are excellent solvents. And it just makes the, the herbal extraction really delicious. So of course it's easy for kids, um, but it's also just really good for you. And we're winding down. To yeah, winding down person. Sage and Fern showing off some Chunk, and their beautiful smiles. And of course, the perks of beekeeping is eating comb right from the hive when it is still 95 degrees. Yum. And it wouldn't be a slideshow presentation <laughs> without a, a picture of our faithful Australian Shepherd <laughs> Cedar and Tulsi. Yeah. And, and I think and that's it. That, yeah. Oh, yep, that's how end of our, it would have been nice. We, we should have had a little QR code. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, to, to lead to the book sales, but you got that. Should we uh, stop sharing screen at this point? Yeah, well, you could, we could do that. And uh, then we uh, we can go to with it. We haven't had much in the way of questions. We got a couple. Um, I had one, Erica, in that 
earlier you had said you have one of your mating yards near an area where there is um, natural forest. Do you have any impressions of how many natural feral colonies there may be in that particular area? Have you ever done any scouting or any? Well, yes. You know, having lived around here for a long time, I feel like we have a pretty good sense of that. It was interesting that when we moved here in 2003, uh, all of the locals were sort of caught up with the idea of where did all the bees go? And when, when we first arrived, you know, we were, what does that put us about 15 years into Varroa and they it clearly had affected the feral population fairly negatively. We, we did a lot of swarm uh, hunting in the early days. And we noted in our first few years of being here that the swarms that we would pick up oftentimes were, uh, subpar. They were small uh, and even would surprisingly end up with Varroa pretty fast. And so clearly we're showing up with uh, fairly high levels of phoretic Varroa and uh, succumbing to their effects fairly rapidly. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seemed like feral colonies, uh, robust feral colonies were few and far between. That does seem to have improved. Um, you know, it's hard for us to know that much about feral colonies because so much of our life is surrounded by managed colonies. But because we're migratory, uh, there is periods of time when our home yards are not occupied by managed colonies. And we do, uh, we have like an equipment storage shed, for instance, here yeah. on the farm that picks up swarms regularly, even when they're, even when our colonies are absent. And, and we're almost certain they're, they're coming off the, the, forested hillside next to us mm -hmm. and you you can in fact many in many occasions we've witnessed watched them fly down from the hill above and fly into our equipment so we know they're out there um, and we certainly see more swarm calls and what have you um, there are hobby beekeepers in the valley but there's they're not that many so I think that it's fair to say we have a good number of feral colonies um, very good interesting of, yeah that's important in terms of your um some of your selections as you pointed out uh med hat was wondering um you had mentioned oxalic that was the material that you'll use for mite control typically in a season what what time of year will you use the oxalic a, as a mite control technique you want me to speak that mm -hmm. um that's a great question um so at the moment we are about to administer some oxalic treatments. Uh, we have not treated our colony since August of last year. <laughs> so they're, they're, we're seeing some, some mite pressure right now. And uh, like I said, we kind of work our way through the spring uh, doing, when we do our walkaway splits, we are targeting capped brood, trying to remove as much yeah. of the mite population from the queen right colony as possible. And uh, also the kind of the cool, feature of uh, growing bees in triple Western format is that, the, you know, bees raise brood in an upward direction, uh, moving into new boxes as you super with them. And we're able to actually go down into the oldest part of the brood nest. And we have pretty darn good anecdotal evidence that we're removing brood that has a higher contamination rate than the brood that we're leaving behind. Anyway, um, so we do that and that avoids uh, us, that typically allows us to avoid a spring mite treatment is working our hives intensively from the period of March to uh, about now. Um, so we're ready to do a mite treatment. Um, we, we vaporize, we also do create queenless environments either by treating walkaway splits, uh, maybe like uh, after the brood has emerged, but before the queen has started laying. We also, um, we will initiate queen right splits. So we'll go into an overwintered colony at this time of year, and we will put the queen into a nucleus colony that goes up onto the roof, uh, onto the lid, uh, goes above the parent colony, creating a period of queenlessness in the parent colony. And we can then come back roughly two weeks after that and find all the worker brood emerged and then do a oxalic dribble. And we like to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, we typically do a winter oxalic dribble in our broodless period. 
But sometimes, depending on how our seasons go, we don't find a good broodless period to do that. Uh, if we have a really warm, prolonged, warm fall, then we will have a significant amount of brood present uh, at the new year. And so this year and last year, we didn't conduct uh, winter dribbles and we're just kind of riding it. And we definitely experienced some losses from it, but that's kind of right where we want to be. Uh, Matt Hat, do any, you want to follow up on any of that? Uh... Oh, that's great. Uh, that's thank good. you okay. for the yeah. answer. Yeah. Just a question. Do you think, uh, Eric, uh, the might, higher might level at this time is coming back because your bees were in pollination and got reinfested and coming back, it's building up again and you have to treat at this time? Well, it's always possible that there's a level of drift occurring. Certainly, I mean, the, the, there's, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the studies going on, trying to get a handle on drift and varroa movement. It, it does seem that some of the data is showing that the varroa move around the most during uh, dearth periods, when, and especially when, when populations of varroa start getting really high. So it seems like the highest drifting is occurring at the end of summer. So I'm sure, I'm sure we're experiencing some ingression, introgression of mites into our operation down in California. I'd like to hope that most of the colonies in proximity to ours are being maintained in a state of strength and help at, health at that time of year and hopefully keeping that varroa movement to a minimum. We do have the benefit of pollinating uh, some blocks of orchards down in California where uh, we hold contracts with fellow Southern Oregon beekeepers. So we, we tend to know whose bees are in proximity to ours. That's not, that's not exclusively true. We have a, a couple of uh, California beekeepers that are in proximity to ours, but we do feel good that we know most of the managers, most of the operators, and they're, they're really on, on top of their bees. So I would say, if anything, they'd probably be more concerned about us. But <laughs> it's always a two-way street. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Diana C. wanted to know, Joy, where you sell your June? Well, right now, really just at the Ashland Farmer's Market, uh, we're going to be going to Spirit Weavers this next week. It's a two-week um, uh, gathering here in Southern Oregon, and I am teaching both uh, apotherapy and natural nest beekeeping there. Uh, we used to have a uh, a fancy 3,000 square foot natural food store in downtown Cape Junction. And there we had nine taps uh, on tap and um, we sold a lot of gen there. Um, that store, uh, we sold it last June and was have been just working on, on the book and the new owners are gonna be uh, bringing the gen back here soon and uh, we'll be bringing kegerators, but that will be in downtown Cape Junction. Well, and also uh, Cave Junction Farmer's Market now. We're back oh, yeah. at Cave Junction Farmer's Market. Yeah. And uh, we we do a lot of special orders. Joy definitely makes a lot of kombucha for special events, parties, weddings, yeah. what have you. So if anyone's interested, they can reach out to us through the website. And, yeah, interested. that's a pretty fun way to do it. For those that are not familiar, um, this used to be a, a heaven of an area for vetch. The original pioneers that came to, to the Willamette Valley, this Western Oregon, that was that was just everywhere and with agriculture they've you know replaced it with other things but uh in areas where you get back off of the a little bit off of the beaten track you can still find just amazing amounts of vetch and it it is a beautiful honey when it's when you get it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we thank you very much for uh sharing this um melanie put in the information in terms of the uh the book uh that will be out very soon as you say they are taking pre-orders if you are of an interest appreciate your uh sharing your uh, your your philosophy in terms of bees and uh your journey that uh, the bees and your farming have taken you uh, with your lovely daughters appreciate very much that you're sharing uh, that with us this evening thank you well, thank you so Dewey. much for having us Okay. Yep. We're going to finish up, um, uh, bring on Ron. Uh, Ron Miksha has uh, been hard, hard at work, believe me. Uh, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a great party, fantastic party, and it's going to be at the end of September. But I'll let Ron give us the, the story of the WAS conference that's coming at the end of 
of September to Calgary, Alberta. Ron? Yeah, yeah hi. I, um, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, I, I certainly um, appreciated that uh, that talk that just ended, and uh, um, it's it's just fascinating the different ways that people can be keeping bees and and uh, and and the success that they're having. So so I'm really going to look for their book, and uh, hopefully it'll be available somewhere where we can. Uh, maybe Amazon. I don't know, but we'll see. Okay, so I want to uh, share a screen here, and uh, just take me a second or two to get that up and running. And um, and once it is, let me just um, open up. Let's see. Hello. Can you see my screen? We can see it, but it's not yet full screen, Ron. Right. Okay. Oh, and um, I am is. going to publish to the chat um, uh, an, a uh, a URL, uh, a web address that uh, you can jump to and uh, and be able to uh, uh, follow that link to learn more about this uh, this conference okay so uh, i'll try to go through this relatively quickly and i appreciate the patience of the people who are still here that's really really nice of you and i do want to continue our invitation to come up to calgary and enjoy what we've got to show here um, this is going to be for the was AGM and conference, which is um, in in conjunction with the local uh, beekeepers club, which has about 400 members. So the Calgary Beekeepers Club is nothing to sneeze at. It's a very active, big organization, and they have supplied a lot of the volunteers and some of the financing, and they have been helping, helping, helping with this. So I'm going to forget some names, but I definitely want to mention Liz Goldie, uh, who is uh, a big part of, of getting this conference uh, organized and worked on here in Calgary. and um, Keith Bellingham. Keith, Keith went out of his way to find a venue that would work for us. So anyway, we're sure hoping that the end of September and the first part of October will be open on your calendars so that you can come on up here. And um, so where is Calgary? We're, we're kind of at the top of your map there. And, um, and, and that's a nice place to be on the top of the map. So because we're that far north and because the conferences have not been held in Calgary or ever before, and in Canada for quite a few years, we have a theme of northern northern lights beekeeping. In other words, uh, you know, like what's it like to keep bees in the far north? And and there's so much that we can share with you on that. So coming here, it's not outrageously expensive, and these prices vary considerably from time to time. So keep looking on your um, keep doing a search for, for good tickets, but um, this, these are return fares, so, so coming up and going back home, although I think probably a majority of the people who are visiting from the States are not going to want to go back home uh, once they've seen Calgary. Why Calgary? It's fun. It's a, it's a, um, a beautiful uh, metropolis of about a million and a quarter, close to a million and a half people now uh, in the city and the surrounding area. We are known as a cattle town, so we're on the edge of the mountains in the prairies and the plains, and, um, and, and agriculture has a big role to play in our province. And um, beekeeping as well. So for the province of Alberta, the uh, production of honey here is higher than any of the other provinces in Canada because of a number of factors. I'll show a little bit about that in a minute. But this is Calgary. This is a, 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 an aerial view of where these million and a half people kind of, kind of fit in. And you'll fly into this airport unless you drive north on, uh, on, on the number two highway coming up from Great Falls, Montana. You may choose that route to come in. Fly, if you do fly in, uh, Uber, uh, as well as all sorts of taxi companies, will bring you down to the um, lower left-hand corner of the of the uh, of the map of Calgary, and there you can see is is the uh, uh, venue site. So it's within a, um, about 20 or 30 minute drive from the airport, and it is close to a lot of other amenities, hotels, other things are in the vicinity. Not right next door to it, 
as you'll see in a, in a minute, we, we've chosen a place that's just on the edge of the city. But um, so where is it? It's the Gray Eagle Resort. Now, this is on part of the Sutina Nation, which borders on Calgary. And this is a very modern, up-to-date um, resort that has uh, received uh, from TripAdvisor a four out of 116 hotels in Calgary. This hotel is considered the fourth best one. And this is where the meeting is going to be held. It will be held on the ground floor uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the con in, in the hotel area. So those of you who are able to stay at the hotel will just hop an elevator and come down. Restaurants are here and, um, and all of the talks and, and meetings, workshops and so on are going to be held right there. And back out, well, yeah, this, I'm not going to go into this. This is typical. Okay, so back out a little bit. This kind of gives you a better view of where we are in the city, and the venue is on Sutina Nation property, and this is the hotel that we were looking at a moment ago, and down on this end is a, an arena. A, a, um, uh, most weekend evenings, they'll have a, a performance of some sort, and you're so lucky that you're going to be coming up now because Air Supply is going to be performing on Saturday night. You probably will skip them because we're also going to be having the uh, uh, banquet on Saturday night. But uh, if you roll down your windows, you might be able to hear them. Anyway, not too many air supply fans. I don't know. <laughs> Calgary inside of Alberta. Uh, we are about one hour from the mountains. And the Banff, Banff National Park is, is just setting out here. Calgary is is right underneath my picture of the city and if you go an hour to the east or even less you're going to see some beautiful badlands dinosaur bone country um, arid farming cattle ranching and irrigated patches of beautiful sweet clover and alfalfa which are fantastic for honey production too okay so why in Alberta well obviously since we hadn't been up here for a while with a WAS conference, then it's a good fit. But mostly because um, your president of WAS is um, uh, Etienne um, Tardif, and he is from, not Alberta, but from the Yukon. And he is directing most of this uh, organization and doing so much groundwork on, on getting this conference going. But as president of WAS, um, he, uh, wanted of course to have something that would be relatively close the Yukon has a total population of about 60,000 folks and probably half a dozen beekeepers so choosing to team up with the folks in Calgary was probably a, a really good choice there so why do we produce so much honey in Alberta it is the biggest producing province in uh, Canada it uh, has about 350,000 colonies of bees at the moment, and they produce an average of about 150 pounds per hive. Uh, big crops, long days, very long days. Uh, in fact, tonight, I think the sun set at about 9.35 or a little later than that here in Calgary. If you go further north, of course, it will still be up even longer and uh, inside, or inside the province. And, and our mornings start quite early, like about 5.30, the sun is up. I can see bees flying, gathering honey at, at 6.30 or 7 in the morning. So um, this, is, this, of course, is, is an old photograph, but it's an absolutely honest picture of, uh, of honey production in the Peace River country of Alberta. Uh, probably 40 or 50 years ago. So in those days, they, they would have started with a package and sometimes do two queen packages and just keep piling the supers on because the bees can make 30 or 40 pounds of honey in a single day and 120, 150 pounds in a week is not unheard of. We also have the extreme winter weather um, as well as sometimes very hot summer weather, sometimes uh, uh, conditions that are less than ideal, but nevertheless, year after year, we seem to produce quite a lot of honey up here. And that's what we're going to focus on with Northern Lights beekeeping, but that's not the only thing that you're going to be able to uh, see and hear at our conference. We've got speakers coming from quite a, quite a few 
parts of the world. I think the, the most recent speaker to, uh, that, that we've been able to sign up is actually from the country of Ghana in Africa. Um, so we, we've got a variety of, of talks with this as a focus since you will be up here. I mentioned the honey production back in the early days, uh, say in the 1920s and before, I think honeybees were brought to Alberta around 1870 or 1880, somewhat close to the time of the first European settlers moving into Alberta. In those days, there was no canola, no sweet clover, and no alfalfa. So the bees had to depend on, on basically wild flowers. And back in the 20s, uh, and um, up until about 1930, that's when the amount of, of clovers and alfalfa suddenly sprung up with ranchers becoming more settled and not just uh, wintering the, their cattle out on the open prairie, but actually corralling them and raising hay. And that's when honey production took off with those imported plants. We got a lot of honey over the years, even as recently as the 70s and into the 90s. The average crop per pound in Alberta was reaching 200. Now, in the last few years, it's stabilized quite a bit. And there's a number of reasons that may have happened, but um, the suspicion is that we now run quite a few bees, I think 70,000 colonies, into uh, canola pollination in Alberta. And the honey production during canola pollination is quite low. So if you average in that low production, and, and it's also low year after year after year. So that tends to have a dampening effect on the um, oscillation of, of these honey crops. So, you know, a, a, a wet year, lots of honey on the, on the dry prairies and in a dry year, it falls off. But today, about 130 pounds is, is our average when we include those 70,000 colonies that are taken to pollination. This is not an unusual setup. These hives are not stacked as high as a lot of people would because at this time I was running colonies of bees for comb honey production. So you can see one, two, three, four, five comb honey boxes um, on, on this colony and um, we would usually take boxes off twice in season. And um, so, so, and obviously I'm not showing the hive that has only two boxes on it or the one down there with two boxes. Things are, are variable like that, of course. This is setting on the edge of an alfalfa field in cattle country, so they were able to make quite a bit of honey there. The only reason this picture is in this in this uh, storyline is because uh, of the uh, mountains in the distance. We are at a high elevation, and there are places around Calgary and just south of Calgary where your beehives could be in sight of, of mountains. And this is just on the edge of Calgary. Okay, so I'm almost done. What, what are you going to expect? Um, well, we're going to have on, on the Friday, uh, if you can be up here for that, that we're, we will have workshops and those will include uh, 3D printing, winter preparations, how to wrap bees for 40 degrees below zero and they need to be wrapped for seven months or so, um, working with wax, disease control, um, beekeeping economics is going to be one of the subjects that will be in the workshop so can analyze how well your colonies could be doing if um, if you produce just a few pounds more per hive or if the honey price should go up just a bit fencing uh, is going to be one of the workshops and that's going to be in regards particularly of, of uh, bears including grizzlies we have a great speaker lineup and it's still building, it's still growing, but Chief Lee Crowchild of the Tutina Nation is going to kick off the first day along with, we are expecting um, several other um, speakers, heads of, of the CDBA and, um, and the WAS group, as well as uh, probably, um, I'm, I'm expecting that the Agriculture Minister for Alberta will be also coming on. That might be my dog in the background. Um, <laughs> Uh, in, in no particular alphabetical order, we've got Anthony Melithopoulos coming up, Dewey Karen's going to be speaking, um, Etienne Tardif, of course the president, uh, is going to be addressing the group as a presenter, Jeff Wilson of Saskatchewan, Julia Common, Juliana Rangel, uh, Cameron Reynolds Medhat, thank you, uh, Naria Morfin, Olaf uh, Rupel, uh, Dr. Rupel is uh, new, to the province as of about two years and he is uh, running a research lab for apiculture beekeeping out of um, the University of Alberta in Edmonton. 
I'm going to be presenting something, and um, Shelly Hoover's been invited up. She's only available for the workshop day, but she will be coming up. And then, of course, we're going to have tours. Uh, that'll be on the Monday, and those tours will include um, beekeeping tours to some of the large honey shops around our area, as well as cultural tours to investigate uh, um, the the indigenous um, uh people's um, uh, neighborhoods, or just which are just basically you're going to be staying and we're going to be listening uh, on Sutina Nation. So right there. And also we want to encourage people to maybe take a few extra days and do a self-guided tour, rent a car. They're really quite inexpensive to rent here. Uh, October, early October is still a beautiful time of the year, most years in our area and you could be heading up to uh, Banff and, and the mountains in just an hour. Okay, my last slide, um, I did post the um, uh, information link for going into um, to register. So register, register, register. Uh, rooms are selling out. So um, there are plenty of hotels in uh, in Calgary, but Calgary is a tourist destination. Even though October is off season, we don't have as many hikes in the summer or as much skiing yet, but it's still a very popular place. So make sure you get registered, make sure you reserve a place to stay. Campsites do exist around Calgary too. And don't forget the workshops on Friday, presentations Saturday and Sunday, and the tours on Monday. So anybody still with me? A few people. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, again, that invitation, we really do want to see folks uh, get up here and en enjoy uh, Calgary, enjoy the WAS CDBA conference, and uh, be sure to not miss this one. Okay. Any questions from anyone? I guess I said enough. Okay. Um, again, uh, the information is posted online. Um, it's not too early to get uh, registered. Uh, we will have a little bit more next meeting, our July meeting, uh, but we um, we want you to do um, make your plans now, make your reservations. Um, and uh, we hope that we're going to see all of you or most of you in um, July, end of July. Uh, I'm sorry, this is going next month is July, the end yep. of September in Calgary. That's the place to be. It's coming up almost as quick as July is. So yeah, yeah please, yeah. please register, um, get, get active on this because uh, it'll, it'll slip up on you and, um, and, and you do want to be here. I'd like to thank our speakers this evening. Um, Ellen, top of top is high, how, 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 you know, Ellen, of course, and the McEwens. And thank you, Ron, for that um, that great uh, uh, introduction to what we're going to have as our great party in September. Thank you all for attending. Um, we'll be posting soon on what we're going to have in the July mini conference. But until then, we'll see you and good beekeeping. Thank you all. <laughs>